Om Ajnana Timarandasya Jnantana Samakaya Chaksura Nilitanyena Tasmai Shri Parave Namaha Panchakaupa Tarupyascha Kripa Sindhu Vaihevacha Atitanam Pavanityo Vaishnavityo Namo Namaha Namaham Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Niti Namene. Namaste Sarasati Devi, Kauravani Pracharine, Nirvisesya Sundavadi, Paschatya Deshatarine. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So this is the auspicious month of Kartik, and in this month many very special events take place. Do we want translation? Everyone's okay? So uh, the month of Kartik is very auspicious. Many special festivals take place. Just this evening coming here, we saw some people also celebrating Halloween. <laughs> so that's one of the auspicious events. <laughs> uh, we had Govardhan Puja, and we had also the disappearance day of uh, His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. We have also the appearance of Radha Kun, and we have also the beginning on Friday, we'll begin the, what is called Bhisma Pancha, which is a special event taking place and for the last five days of the month of Kartik, which is also the last five days of the uh, Chaturmasya, which is the four months of austerity, which uh, is practiced by devotees. So many events taking place during the month of Kartik. And the one event, of course, which we're remembering throughout the month is this pastime of Damodara, the Lila of Damodara, as we see here in the central figure on the altar here. Mother Yashoda is binding rope, using her rope to bind, to try to bind up Lord Krishna. So binding up Lord Krishna, we would all like to be able to bind up Krishna. That's something which we have a long way to go before we could ever be able to be worthy of doing something like binding up Lord Krishna. We want to understand Mother Yashoda is not an ordinary person but she's a very, very great personality who has actually come to this world, or rather she came to this world 5,000 years ago, just as Lord Krishna comes to this world. So Mother Yashoda also came along with her husband, Nanda Maharaj, and they come from the abode in the in the spiritual sky, in the Paravyoma, where everyone has a spiritual body, a form of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. And Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, along with other devotees, they all come to take part in Lord Krishna's Leela, or his pastimes, which he performs when he comes into this world. Lord Krishna is 
the supreme enjoyer. All of us like to enjoy, right? We don't want to suffer. We like enjoyment. We're looking for pleasure, enjoyment. We enjoy kirtan. We enjoy chanting and dancing. We enjoy prasadam, like that. These different activities which we engage in are giving spiritual pleasure. So similarly, when Lord Krishna comes into this world, he comes also to enjoy. He enjoys, he doesn't need to come really to kill the demon. So although sometimes people may accuse him like that, that, oh, Krishna, he's a killing god. <laughs> yeah, because we hear about Krishna killing sometimes demons. And then Krishna encouraged also the battle of Kurukshetra. But Lord Krishna doesn't have to come to kill. He can do the killing business without coming personally. Because he's in the heart of everyone. So at any time, he can simply leave the heart. And when he goes out of the heart, then that's the end of the life. That's it. The body becomes a dead body. And when Krishna goes out of the heart, the soul, the living entity, who's also in the heart, he goes along with Krishna. Just like two birds in a tree. The same way there are two souls in the body. One soul we call the Jiva Atma, and the other soul we say Param Atma. The example is given about birds in a tree. In Vrindavan, there are many parrots, green parrots. They say actually parrots are often used by Radha and Krishna. They send messages to each other through the parrots. Just like we have our mobile phones, Radha and Krishna just simply use the parrot to communicate with each other. So the parrots, the, one is Sutta and the other is Sari. And Sutta is a male and Sari is a female. The two, the two kinds of parrots. They're green color. And in Vrindavan, the trees are also green, the green leaves. So when the birds fly into the tree, you don't see the birds anymore. They're in the tree, but you can't see them because they're the same color as the leaves on the tree. So in this way, the birds appear to merge into the tree, but actually they keep their identity. They keep their individuality. In the same way, the soul enters into the body. Without the soul in the body, then it's simply the dead body. There has to be the soul. As Srila Prabhupada went to the USA and the devotees arranged for him to give a talk in the MIT, Massachusetts Institution of Technology. Very prestigious institution. You know, the people who go there, they're really, you know, <laughs> just like in India, if you get into IIT, you know, you, you really, you're really good. You know, you really made it. You, go, you can go to America anytime because you made it into IIT. And so if you go into MIT, it's also very prestigious. So Prabhupada was there and he was giving the, the talk. And uh, in the beginning, uh, well, Prabhupada gave a, a beautiful lecture, and uh, and then people were asking. He said, "Are there any questions?" And so naturally, you know, MIT, they're very intelligent people. They had questions, uh, but whatever questions they asked, Srila Prabhupada just went right through them, just, <laughs> you know, like somebody, somebody said, uh, 
Yeah, somebody, someone was talking about uh, this person who claimed, oh, oh, he was talking about, he said, revolution. He said, you know, it, it, he talked about Russia and they had the revolution. And he said, don't you think this is good, you know, the free, free the people from the bondage of slavery? And, and Srila Prabhupada just said to him, he said, are the people free? Do you think the people are free just because they change from one system of government to another? Does it mean the people are free? And Prabhupada asked, can you say the people are happy now? And the, the young man said, well, no. And so Prabhupada said, then what is the use? The people are no happier than they were before. You simply changed the government. It didn't make any difference to the lives of people. In this way, Srila Prabhupada was dismantling all of the thinking which these young people had. And very quickly, they realized they weren't going to defeat Srila Prabhupada. And then Srila Prabhupada brought up the subject of what is the difference between the living body and the dead body? And then nobody could answer. You know, they were trying to give some material formula to understand the difference between life and death. Generally, scientists don't accept the existence of a spiritual energy. But there is such a thing as spiritual energy. And that spiritual energy is coming from the soul. The scientists, they cannot explain what is the source of energy behind the heart, which makes the heart beat. And sometimes people ask, what happens when they do heart transplant? And Srila Prabhupada explained very clearly what happens when they do a heart transplant. He said, just like you have your car and you change the seat in the car. You know, maybe you didn't like the seat which was in your car. and You want to put in a different seat in the car. So you change the seat. But the drive, it's still your car. You just change the seat. You're going to get in the car and drive it. You just change the seat. So similarly, when they change the heart, it's simply the soul is changing its seat. The heart is like the seat of the soul. So you take out one heart and you put in another heart. And the soul gets out of the old heart, and then gets in the new heart. The person is the same. Because the person is not the body. The person is the soul. And the soul is not material. Sometimes people do experiments to try to measure the soul, the weight of the soul. They did, you know, they were waiting. Somebody was going to die. They knew this person was going to leave the body. So they were carefully measuring the weight of the body. And they wanted to get the weight of the body immediately after his death. But they couldn't detect any difference between the weight when he was alive and the weight after he'd left the body. They could not detect the weight because the soul does not have weight. The soul is not material. It is spiritual. Spirit is the energy of the kingdom of God. In the, in the Paravyoma, in the spiritual sky, it's all spiritual energy. And the nature of spirit is Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. 
we want to awaken that kind of consciousness. Actually, we are all spiritual beings, and we are all meant to be full of knowledge and bliss eternally. We are not experiencing this because we are covered by the material body, and the material body is just the opposite of the spiritual. The material body is temporary miserable and ignorant. When we see people, sometimes, you know, they look morose. They don't look joyful, blissful. We can understand they're not in Krishna consciousness. We want to bring them to Krishna consciousness. And of course, the process is very simple. It's very easy to come to consciousness of Krishna. And it begins with the chanting of the holy name. So this evening, devotees were chanting very nicely for us. It, that chanting awakens the spiritual energy. And you can feel the transformation in the energy, in the environment, by the chanting. From the outside, as I came into the building, I could hear the beating of the Madanga and the sweet singing of the Holy Name. So I could under, understand there's a spiritual atmosphere. There's a spiritual program taking place. This worship Dhammadar is for this purpose, to help all of us this uh, month of Dhammadar, this program is to help all of us to awaken our consciousness, our spiritual consciousness. We all have consciousness, but there are different levels of consciousness. For example, tree. A tree also has some consciousness. They also have some life. But their consciousness is very covered because of the type of body which they have. But you can see there's, there's life. You can tell when a tree is alive and when it's dead. There's a difference. The trees grow up towards the light, towards the sun. So there is life in the tree, but it's very restricted because of the body. Our Damodar Lila, this Damodar pastime, tells about Lord Krishna pulling the mortar which Mother Yashoda has tied Lord Krishna to. And Lord Krishna pulls that mortar between two big trees which are growing in the yard of Nanda Maharaj. Lord Krishna, although he is only a small child, he has a spiritual body. Just as we celebrated the Govardhan Puja, and we heard how Lord Krishna had picked up the Govardhan Hill. Now, it's inconceivable how anybody could pick up a Govardhan, pick up a hill any kind of hill, what to speak of Govardhan Hill, which is Giriraj Govardhan. It's a king of mountains, but Lord Krishna could pick it up. And how did he pick it up? With his left hand. Now, usually we use right hand. The right hand is stronger. Lord Krishna picks it up with his left hand and holds it with one little finger not for a few moments, but for seven days and nights. How is it possible? It is inconceivable. And that is one thing which we have to understand in order to properly understand Lord Krishna and his Leela, we have to understand that there are such things as Achintya Shakti, 
are the inconceivable energies. Lord Krishna has that kind of energy, unlimited, inconceivably powerful. We see examples of this achincha shakti in our everyday life. Every day you experience the sun. The sun is giving off so much heat and light. Every moment the heat and light which is coming from the sun is of a huge amount of energy which could last many, many, many years. But that's not just one moment for the sun. So the sun is just one example of the inconceivable potency. Confirmed. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada used to tell us about fish which swim in the ocean. He said, there's a timin timingala fish. <laughs> and this Tamingala fish can swallow whales. We, we were all very surprising. A, a fish which can swallow a whale, but this it's told like that. Just like there are dinosaurs from the past. We know that there were dinosaurs on the planet. So in the same way, there are such living entities, inhabitants in the ocean, aquatics, like Timingala fish, which can swallow a whale. And there are gigantic birds, which can fly from one planet to another. We just see little sparrows and so on flying around, but there are actually huge birds, just like Garuda. He can fly through the universe from one planet to another. So there are many examples of this inconceivable potency. And hearing about Lord Krishna and his Damodar Lila is another example of this inconceivable pastime which is taking place. Lord Krishna is coming for his pleasure. He likes to enjoy. And one of the ways in which he enjoys is by just being with his devotees. He enjoys loving relationships with his devotees. Just like we enjoy when you have Diwali, probably you were together with your family, you have, for example, there are, you have servants, you have also friends, you have parents, and you may have also lovers. So these are generally the different relationships which are there. The relationships which we enjoy, they're enjoyed to the fullest extent by Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna also has his devotees and different devotees have different relationships. Mother Yashoda enjoys being the mother of Lord Krishna. Nanda Maharaj is father. In the same way, Lord Krishna has also friends. He has also lovers as the gopis, and he has also servants. The different friendship, different relationships are there, and it's all for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. Lord, we also have a relationship with Krishna. We also have a connection with him, but we have forgotten that. When we have come into this world, we're forgetting our eternal world. Just as we have a home here, we have also a home in the spiritual world, in the spiritual sky. And Lord
Lord Krishna, he comes to this world to invite us all that we can go back there, to attract us, to go back to him. So this Dhammadar Leela, we're, we're during this month, where you can see we have many lamps prepared for offering. And the idea is that we offer the lamp to look to Lord Dhammadar. And just by offering the lamp to the Lord, we get a blessing. It's, it's like an offering. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains that you can offer a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or water. Now, Lord Krishna is not greedy to get our offerings, but what he wants is our devotion. He wants our love. He has many goddesses of fortune. There are many Lakshmis there serving him in the spiritual sky. So he's not greedy to get our offering of fruit and flowers. But what he does want is a little devotion from us. We all have devotion. We all have the ability to love someone and something. Some people are nationalists. They love their country. They will even die for their country. Some people love their dogs. <laughs> yeah. We, we all have this loving affection. A lot of people in Dubai, they love their cars, right? <laughs> cars are very important here. And so we have that ability to love things. We want to direct that love towards Krishna. And this month of Dhammadar is an event which takes place to inspire and encourage all of us to direct that loving relationship to him. And it begins by offering this lamp to Lord Dhammadar. It's a small thing which we do. We just simply take the lamp and we offer it in circles to the Lord and then place it before him. But by making this offering, we're awakening our spiritual body. Our spiritual consciousness is evolving. It's coming about just simply by this little act. It's described how there was a young woman who was born in a very wealthy family and she was very beautiful. And every year during this month of Kartik, she would light many lamps around the temple and she would light lamps in the doorway and she would put lamps along the side of the river and she put lamps even on the well and wherever she could put lamps, she would put them. So people were surprised to see how every day she went and put more and more lights, offered lamps everywhere. And so they asked her, why are you doing this? So she explained to them, she said, you know, you have to understand my previous life. And so they asked, please tell us more. What do you mean your previous life? She said, in my previous life, I was a mouse and I was living, I, I made my home in a temple and I was very hungry. I could not get any food. There was nothing to eat. So when people would offer a ghee lamp, I would come and I'd eat the cotton and eat the ghee, which was on the cotton. And so the little girl explained that one day when I was in the body of a mouse, I, ate, I was eating the ghee wick. One end of the ghee wick was burning. It was lit up and it had been placed in front of the deity of Lord Krishna. So at that time, the little mouse came and began to eat the wick. But then a cat also came. And when the cat came, the little mouse became so afraid, the mouse grabbed the gee-wick and ran away, carrying the gee-wick. But the gee-wick set fire to the fur of the mouse, and the mouse became ablaze. And when the mouse was on fire, the mouse was jumping around in front of the deity. 
and in this way the mouse died. So the young girl, the young lady explained, she said, this is why, he said that one life I offered one lamp in front of the deity during that month of Kartik. So she said, now I have this human body, I have this body, I'm a wealthy woman, I don't have anything lacking. She said, I want to make sure I get the greatest benefit from lighting these lamps. Therefore, I'm lighting as many lamps as I can every day during this month of Kartik. Offering something to Lord Krishna in the month of Karti gives hundreds of times more benefit than an offering made any other time of the year. It's so special during this month. You do something at this time, you get many, many more times of benefit than any other time of the year. So it's very special. So we want to encourage all of you also to take the opportunity tonight to offer one lamp to Lord Damodar. And you can also make a prayer in your mind, in your heart. You can also ask Lord Damodar, please help me to develop my spiritual consciousness. Because simply being in conscious of the body this is not actually our real self. And that we all know this body is temporary, but our soul is eternal. And if we can develop this consciousness of the soul, then we can achieve the greatest benefit. That benefit means get out from this world of birth and death take a spiritual form. We have a spiritual form and we have a place. We have an opportunity to join, to be with Lord Krishna in his own abode and to take part in his pastimes and to be with the gopis. You like chanting the holy name? The gopis are chanting the holy name. Every day and night, they're chanting and singing the glories of Lord Krishna. So in this way, the devotee passes his time in remembrance of Krishna. So are there any questions before we offer the lamp? Anyone has any question? Everyone can understand? Sometimes it is also translated as dan, charity. So the question is, why is it that it's, it is used as dan, uh, like deep dan? What's the, what's the difference between when we say offering the lamp or giving dan to uh, dan of light? <coughs> is there any difference or is it just a question of linguistics? Or just a question of yeah, language. Language, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, there are, you know, sometimes dan is usually mean you're giving something to somebody who's needed, yeah, so in lower, you know, but what we actually want to do is we're giving to something higher, right, we're offering to Lord Krishna, so it's not actually dan, but we're looking to get the blessings, to get the mercy from Lord Krishna. You, you give charity to the, the, the needy person or for some good cause. But uh, when we make an offering to Lord Krishna, we're giving what is actually his. We're recognizing him as the proprietor. And this is stated like in Bhagavad Gita, that we should understand Krishna is the Mahishwa, right? He is the proprietor of everything. And we want to understand him in that way, that everything is his. Bhakti yoga is not giving anything to Krishna because in bhakti yoga, 
everything is Krishna's. You don't have anything to give him, it's all his. In karma yoga, however, you do karma yoga, you're thinking, I'm giving this to Krishna. We're thinking I'm giving something to Krishna. But in bhakti yoga, we understand it's all Krishna's. I'm just giving what is his. I have nothing of my own, it's all his. Of course, sometimes people say it's all his, but they're very expert in <laughs> using for their own sense gratification. And so when we say it's really Krishna's, we want to use everything for Krishna, for Krishna's service. <laughs> Thank you for your enlightening session. Uh, Maharaj, like um, we hear about um, the loving devotional service. Uh, how do we uh, develop that resolute uh, determination for progressing in spiritual life? You know, because there are so many diversions, you know, in this uh, materialistic way of life we are living. And uh, we have different ways uh, we are occupied. <laughs> So that uh, intense feeling and connection with the Lord, how can we develop in that? What is the real process of change of that consciousness? How do we do that? Yes, how to develop that change in consciousness. It's very important for us to do what is what we call sadhana bhakti, or the regular practice of the activities of devotion. You want to have some kind of regular program in your life, just like in the morning you have a you know you have a, a an altar like this. So we should go before the altar and we should recite some prayers, or we should chant. We should do the chanting of the Maha, just like we chant Hare Krishna. And if you have a family, then it's even nicer. You can do kirtan together. So get the family together and get them to do kirtan together in the evening, maybe for 20 minutes or half an hour every day. If you can do something like that, just like in this month of Damodar, many families together, they're singing the Damodar song and offering the lamb. So we do need to have this kind of regulation in our life to keep our determination up. Otherwise, you, we become slack, we become weaker and weaker. And what happens, you go down and down and eventually you just stop, you know. <laughs> you lose the, the determination to continue. So how to keep up that determination? You have to be hearing regularly. You do need to hear. You need to have association also. That's important. And we also, we make a commitment. Just like I myself, I took a bow when I accepted initiation. When I accepted a spiritual teacher, Srila Prabhupada came to London. And I was fortunate that I, was, I had become a devotee. And so he accepted disciples. So at the time we took initiation from Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada asked us, what are the four principles you're going to follow? And so we told him. And then he said, and how many rounds are you going to chant every day? And we said, at least 16. And he said, all right. And he gave me the beats and he said, your name is and like that. He said, now you promised. He said, you must keep that vow. So I'm doing last 50 years. So you, you can do it. It's not so difficult. It becomes a habit. Just like during this month of Damodar, it's an opportunity for us to develop a habit, a good habit. I don't know. Do you have bad habits? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all have some bad habits, right? So we want to develop some good habits. And it's the month of Damodar, this kind, this month of Kartik. It's a very good time to develop good habit. Make a good, make it a habit to worship Lord Krishna, to offer one lamp, 
and you not only in Kartik, you can offer a lamp every day. And in this way, you can cultivate your devotion for Lord Krishna. You go to our temple, you see us offer arti, we're offering the ghee lamb. When we worship Tosi also, we're offering the lamb. So you can do this every day, not only in the month of Kartik, but it's especially powerful at this time during the month of Kartik. And it's a very good time to develop this habit. And you get the habit, then you will be more determined to keep up that standard. You don't want to, to reduce. Right, you started to do something and you know it's a good habit. You want to keep doing it. You don't want to give it up. You know, before becoming, before entering into Krishna consciousness, you know, I have bad habits. But becoming a devotee, yeah, we, we make a vow, make a promise. Good to do good, just to eat prasada, not to eat all the garbage food and no intoxication and no gambling and no smoking and drinking and these things. So give up all the nonsense, Prabhupada would say, no nonsense. So all the bad habits, that's all the nonsense, right? We give them up. And this month of Kartik, it's a good time for people to give up the bad habits, especially people are encouraged to be vegetarian during this month of Kartik. Don't eat any non-veg food. So then once you start becoming a vegetarian, then you realize how easy it is to be a vegetarian and how much nicer it feels. We had a scientific conference. Our devotees, we have some devotees in our movement who are uh, PhDs in science, and they organize sometimes scientific conferences and they bring Nobel Prize winners from, from America and like that. They come to attend the scientific conference. So it happened, one of these uh, big professors who came from the USA to attend our scientific conference was, was held in Juhu at the uh, Hare Krishna land there. And uh, we have an auditorium there. So he, he, he come there, this one Nobel Prize winner in, he was attending the scientific conference. So one of my friends, he was uh, accompanying this Nobel Prize winner, Dr. I can't remember what his name was, something. But he was a big man. He won the Nobel Prize in physics and something. And so he asked him, my friend was talking to him, and he asked him, so doctor, how did you enjoy the conference? And he said, well, do you know? He said, he said I've learned something which I never knew before. And the devotee, my friend said to him, I said, oh, what, what was that? He said, I've learned that I can be satisfied on a vegetarian diet. You know, he was coming from America, you know, a meat eater, you know, and coming from the West and coming to India. And if you go to Juhu, you know, we have a very nice restaurant there in Juhu. It's very wonderful restaurant, and they prepare many varieties of foodstuffs. And so he was eating his meals there in the restaurant, and he was appreciating how satisfying the food there is. And he didn't miss the meat and chicken and whatever they usually eat. And he was realizing, I'm, I'm, I can be satisfied on this food. So that's an interesting example, you know, you want to get that kind of determination, become fixed, you know. I have some, I have some habits, one habit is I'm vegetarian, and people may mock at you, oh, you want to be healthy, all oh, this, all oh, that. No, you, will be, you can be healthy, you can do it, it's not so difficult. It's very easy, actually. And Srila Prabhupada went to the West, and he, not, no one was a vegetarian in 1960s. No one was, who was a vegetarian in those days? In USA, there were no Indians there at that time, hardly. And so Prabhupada was preaching to young Americans, and vegetarianism hadn't really been introduced there then. 
But Prabhupada made everyone vegetarian because he cooked so nicely. So that's not a problem. You, don't, you have to learn cooking. <laughs> we have this problem all over the world, you know. <laughs> I, I preach in, in countries like Hong Kong, Taiwan, China. And so generally people there, they know about vegetarianism, but they, they just don't know how to cook. You know, that's a problem. So we do have, we, we organize cooking classes. And it's very important. Get people trained up how to cook, learn how to cook. And when you cook nicely, then people will want to be vegetarian. They, they'll be attracted to it. <laughs> These are some of the challenges. We have to make it look, some, sometimes people think vegetarian, you just eat green leaves and rice. <laughs> you know, they don't know. They don't know how, how many varieties of grains and beans are there. Hmm? Mass food in the arts. <laughs> so it's very important. You have to learn cooking. You have to know how to cook nicely. And Prabhupada actually told us he learned to cook just watching people cook in the street. You know, in Calcutta, people cook in the streets. They have a you know, little table and they would just stand there and cook. He said he learned cooking just watching people in the street. But he was expert, he was a wonderful cook. And he taught the devotees, he taught all the devotees how to cook. And then the devotees, they went, he sent them around the world and they went, they opened up centers. And you go to Australia now, you know, we have wonderful restaurants there, go into restaurants. And, and there's more and more vegetarian restaurants opening here in Dubai, right? One of our devotee members, he's got four vegetarian restaurants in Dubai. Govinda. Yeah. Govinda. Yes. Even in Uganda, I was there. There is Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. There is Govinda restaurant. Oh, yeah. Yes. Govinda is everywhere. Everywhere. So you have to make a Govinda's at home. <laughs> Okay, so now we will do Dhammadhar prayer. Prabhu would like to sing for us Dhammadhar. Okay. Thank you. 